Well, just before we get to God's Word, I'd like to ask actually William and Sharon to stand up because um, some of you might not know, Marswee has been with us. He's been training at Christ's uh, seminary in Polokwane. William and Sharon Vaughan, who are Tim's parents, uh, they live in Polokwane. They're members of Christ Baptist Church. Uh, William's one of the elders there. And they've actually been uh, steering the ministry in Chikumbedzi for a number of years. So it's through them that Marswi came here and is going back there. And they visit monthly there and uh, are involved with the training there. So when you pray for Marswi, do remember William and Sharon as well. And we're grateful for the work that you do there and that you remember that you're sojourners living in a tent. That was the first time I saw your home there. So it's a good reminder. So thank you very much for your faithful ministry there. So remember to pray for William and Sharon Vaughan when you pray for Marswi. Thank you. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. Throughout the world, it's commonplace for believers when they get together on this Resurrection Sunday to remind one another that the Lord Jesus is risen from the dead. And often the leader will say, Christ is risen. And the congregation will say, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And people say this throughout the world, east and west, north and south. So let's try that. So I say, Christ is risen, and you say, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. risen I hope you believe that. Should we try it again? Christ is risen. risen Amen. Well, I wonder if you've given much thought to how the disciples responded to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were thinking, especially on Friday, how he was publicly crucified. He was laid in a grave. And then on the Sunday, he was wonderfully and gloriously raised from the dead. The ladies went to the tomb. The tomb was empty. When they got there, the stone had been rolled away. So they raced back to tell the other disciples. How did they respond? The Lord Jesus appeared to a number of disciples. How did they respond? How did they respond to seeing him having conquered death and sin? Well, the scriptures tell us that they were doubtful and confused, and fearful, and unbelieving. So how did the Lord Jesus correct them? How did he comfort them? How did he convince them that he really was risen from the dead? Did he do some amazing miracle for them? No, he didn't. Did he perhaps tell them about the glories of heaven and and how wonderful heaven is? No, he didn't. Actually, he pointed them to the scriptures. He simply reminded them of what the scriptures said about his suffering and about his resurrection. And he opened their minds to understand what was in the scriptures. Friends, for you to be convinced that Christ is risen from the dead, in order for you to be encouraged as you live following him, you don't need great miracles. You don't need dreams or visions or so-called prophecies. You don't need extraordinary experiences. You need the scriptures. And you need simply to believe, to trust the Scriptures. The Lord has given us the Scriptures to encourage us and to give us hope. The Old Testament 
New Testament scriptures breathed out by God. You simply must trust the scriptures. In the scriptures, through the eye-opening work of the Holy Spirit, we have all that we need for life and godliness. We have all that we need for life, for eternal life, that we might have peace with God, that we might know him and love him and enjoy him forever. We have all that we need in the scriptures, breathed out by God, for a life of godliness, a joyful, holy life, pleasing and honouring our triune God. Friends, you simply must trust the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ repeatedly showed his confidence in the scriptures. Scripture simply means the writings. And time and again, he demonstrated his confidence in the scriptures. Remember how when he was tempted by the devil, he quoted scripture. He took out the sword of the spirit. Think about when he was confronted by the unbelieving, mocking Jewish religious leaders. He quoted scriptures. It was suffice, it was enough for him simply to say, it is written, end of argument, end of debate. And here, as we look at the resurrection of Christ, we will see that when the Lord Jesus rebuked his disciples, and when he sought to convince them and to encourage them, to make sense of his suffering, he pointed them to the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ trusted the scriptures. Friends, you simply must trust the scriptures. Let me read for you something from this great little book, Taking God at His Word by Kevin DeYoung. And he speaks here about how the Lord Jesus trusted the scriptures. He says, Jesus held scripture in the highest possible esteem. He knew his Bible intimately and loved it deeply. He often spoke with the language of scripture. His mission was to fulfill scripture and his teaching always upheld scripture. He never disrespected, never disregarded, never disagreed with a single text of Scripture. He affirmed every bit of law, prophecy, narrative, and poetry. He goes on to write, He believed the Bible was all true, all edifying, all important, and all about him. He believed absolutely that the Bible was from God and was absolutely free from error. What Scripture says, God says. And what God said was recorded infallibly in Scripture. He concludes, It is impossible to revere, we might say to respect, the Scriptures more deeply or affirm them more completely than Jesus did. You're going to need to read the Gospels to see that. Jesus submitted his will to the Scriptures, committed his brain to studying the Scriptures, and humbled his heart to obey the Scriptures. The Lord Jesus, God's Son and our Saviour, believed the Bible was the Word of God down to the sentences, to the phrases to the words, to the smallest letter, to the tiniest specks. And that nothing in all those specks and in all those books in his Holy Bible could ever be broken. We need to be like Christ in trusting the Scriptures. So this morning as we look at the resurrection of Christ, we're also going to see from the scriptures, the necessity of his suffering and the mission that he's given to all his followers. 
And I'm going to be exhorting you to simply trust the scriptures so that you might have life and so that you might live a godly life. You need to take God at his word. I'm going to read all of Luke chapter 24. And I want you to see this recurring theme of the disciples' unbelief, their confusion, their doubt, and how the Lord Jesus addresses their doubts with the scriptures. We're going to have a look at just a few verses in depth. But I'd ask that you stand with me as I read God's word, simply because this is the word of God. Luke 24, I'm going to start from verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marvelling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed, And word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, He broke the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognised him. And he 
vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marvelling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. As we stand, let's pray. Powerful, gracious God, triune God, please would you work through your word this morning. Unblock deaf ears, change hard hearts, Give us a renewed hope. Please, minister through your word. We ask for your name's sake. Amen. Please have a seat. We're going to see three ways in which you must trust the scriptures so that you might have life, and such that you might live a godly life. So three points. We're looking basically at verses 44 down to 47. First point, if you're taking notes, trust the scriptures. Christ had to suffer. Trust the scriptures. Christ had to suffer. Let me remind you from verse 44. What is written? Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, that's the Pentateuch, and the prophets, that's the prophets like Isaiah and Amos, but also the history books, Kings and Chronicles, and the Psalms, that covers all of the the writings, poetry and wisdom, must be fulfilled. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer. Christ had to suffer. But why? Why did he have to suffer? Well, what do the scriptures say? 
Let me explain to you why it is that Christ had to suffer. The scriptures tell us that God is holy. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he is holy. He is the creator. He is the owner and ruler of all things. The scriptures tell us that you and I have rebelled against his rule. The scriptures tell us that the soul that sins must die. That God, who is rich in mercy and grace, will not leave the guilty unpunished. The Lord, who is holy and just, cannot turn a blind eye upon our sin. Such that the scriptures tell us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And we know as we we read through the Old Testament that all those sacrifices that were prescribed from the law were animals being slaughtered. They were being killed. As a prefiguring of Christ's once and for all sacrifice. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. I wonder if you realize what a serious predicament you are apart from Christ. It's not from your sin. It's not from a lack of purpose. It's not from your trials and difficulties that you need to be saved. You need to be saved from the wrath of God. Read through Psalm 5. It speaks about the Lord hating sinners. Do you think that you can rebel against him, against his law, and all the while God will simply turn a blind eye to your sin? By nature, we all have a problem. In 1970, there was a a spacecraft that was launched to the moon. It was Apollo 13, and there were three men on board, and the plan was that they were going to land on the moon just as others had previously in 1969. But something went wrong. And one of the oxygen tanks ended up leaking. And obviously they needed oxygen not only for fuel, but to breathe. And when one of the lights on the dashboard started flashing, the commander simply said, OK, Houston, we had a problem. And if you've seen the movie, that's been changed. Houston, we have a problem. The point is that they had a very serious problem. Remarkably, they managed to get back and they survived, all three of them. God's word is like a flashing light and it tells you that you have a problem because of your sin. And that problem is the wrath of God. God's righteous anger, God's justice, which is directed against sinners. But the Bible also tells us the good news, the gospel, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is the gospel. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. The Old Testament repeatedly tells us, promises us, that Christ would come. And it speaks of his suffering and his subsequent glories. Christ Jesus came into the world fulfilling all the scriptures that spoke of his coming. He lived a perfect life, a righteous life, fulfilling all those scriptures. He revealed God's glory such that his disciples said, we have beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only. He lived a beautiful life, a life of integrity, a life of holiness, a life of compassion. And yet, he was despised and he was rejected. His own people, the Jews, handed him over to the Romans 
to be crucified. Christ suffered. But it wasn't because these sinful men had somehow got the better of God. It was because Christ's suffering was part of God's plan of redemption. That through the sufferings of Christ, many would be won for God, would be forgiven. His people would be reconciled to himself through the sufferings of Christ. Christ died according to the scriptures. This is the way that God, in his infinite wisdom, ordained to save a people for himself. That's why we read in Romans 3 that it was through the propitiation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is Christ, the eternal Son of God, bearing the wrath of the Father, that through his sacrifice, God could be at the same time just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So that God, if you like, could maintain his integrity. He didn't need to somehow change and become a God who belittles sin. But through the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, he could be just and justifier of the one who trusts in Christ. Christ had to suffer. Christ suffered according to the scriptures. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. So that through his suffering, in the words of the old hymn, there is a way back to God from the dark path of sin. There is a way that is open and you may come in at Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Christ had to suffer. But do you see, it means that there is no other way. God hasn't intended that there be any other way that you can be reconciled with him, that your sins can be forgiven. Christ himself came into this world to bear the sins of his people, to give himself as a ransom for many so that the many might come and trust him. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. But he then went on to say, no one comes to the Father but by me. There's not another way. You can't come to the Father, have peace with God through trying hard, by being religious, by saying many prayers, by fasting, by reading your Bible, by giving even everything that you have to the poor or for world missions. It's by grace that you're saved. Through faith, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Christ had to suffer for the sins of his people. And there is life in Christ when a man, a woman, a boy or girl comes to Christ, but there is no other name under heaven by which a man might be saved. Are you trusting Christ? Or are you trusting perhaps the fact that you've never done anything too seriously wrong? You know, God's most important commandment is that you should love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. You don't do that. You're a sinner. You need saving. Have you come to Christ? It's a humbling experience, acknowledging that you're a sinner who cannot save himself. But that's what you need to do as the Spirit of God causes a person to be born again. They see their own sin for what it is before a holy God. They're granted faith to trust in Christ. Have you come to Christ? And if not, why not?
Why have you never come to Christ? You've heard the gospel. Why have you not come to Christ? What is stopping you today from coming to Christ? Maybe you've been a churchgoer all your life. Maybe you've been baptized and confirmed. Maybe you're even a missionary or a preacher. And you realize that you've never been trusting Christ. It's going to be hard for you to admit that you've been trusting in yourself all these days. But there is no life outside of Christ. You have to come with empty hands to him and lay hold of him today. Come to Christ. Put your trust in him. Turn from your sin, from your rebellion, from your self-righteousness, and trust in Christ. Christ had to suffer. What about you who know the Lord Jesus Christ and delight in him and own him as your saviour? What is there for you here? Christ had to suffer. Well, it's simply this. Understanding of his suffering comes through the scriptures. We understand why he was naked and nailed to a cross. We understand why there was darkness for three hours. We understand because the scriptures tell us why he suffered more than you or I could ever imagine. And the scriptures make sense of your suffering as well. We understand from the scriptures that God is sovereign. God never drops the ball. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. God only does and always does that which pleases him. God is sovereign. God is wise. God is good. And God determines to bring suffering into your life. God plans trials and difficulties in your life in order that you might be more like Christ. Scripture reminds us of this. Scripture tells us the truth about this so that we understand the purpose of our suffering. Don't we read in Romans 8? All things, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And the scriptures go on to say, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined, why? To be conformed to the image of his Son. That is God's master plan, to redeem a people for himself who will love him and treasure him and enjoy him forever. That we would be made like Christ, glorified. And that process begins when we're saved. We're waiting to see Christ and then we will be finally like him. But that process of becoming like him begins when we're saved. And the Lord sends suffering our way to move that process along. The scriptures help us to understand why we suffer. You need to read the scriptures. Romans 5 verse 8. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We understand when we look to Christ, we see that God loves us. He who gave his own son for us, will he not also in him give us all things? Do you think God is going to send his son for you? Send his spirit for you? Draw you to himself and then leave you on your own? God is with us. And God is working out his good purposes in you through suffering. You need to trust the scriptures. You simply must trust the scriptures and trust what God says about your suffering. 
if you're not sure about that, you need to immerse yourself in the Scriptures. You need to read the Scriptures. You need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to shine His light on the Scriptures. And then you need to trust what God has said. And you will be comforted and encouraged as you understand why it is you are suffering. It is because God has purposed it. Your life is in his hands. Listen to what Adoniram Judson said. Some of you will know he was a missionary along with his wife, Anne, to the people of Burma. He and Anne went to Burma to translate the scriptures and to bring the gospel to the people there. And because, although he was an American, the Burmese were at war with the British, he was imprisoned. And for a year and seven months, he was in a prison cell which had no windows in the stinking heat of Burma. It started off that there were a hundred prisoners in this cell. He had three chains around his body. And some of the time, he was raised up so that only his shoulders touched the ground. There was one of the jailers called Spotty Faced. That's what they nicknamed him. And they knew that when he came in, one of the prisoners was being taken out for execution. They didn't feed him. He depended upon his wife, Anne. Sometimes she begged for food to bring it to him. In the midst of all this, one of Judson's fellow prisoners sneered, what about the prospects of the conversion of the heathen? In other words, what's going to happen now? You came here to bring the gospel that people might be saved. What now? The missionary calmly replied, the prospects are just as bright as the promises of God. He was trusting in the promises of God. And by God's grace, he was not only imprisoned, but he was released and he went back to translating the Bible and bringing the gospel. And when he died, it said that there were 7,000 believers in Burma. He was trusting the scriptures. Just as Christ had to suffer, so as it is necessary in God's eyes, we too will suffer. And we need to trust God that there's a purpose in our suffering. Second point, trust the scriptures. Christ had to rise. Christ had to rise. Verse 44, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. The Lord Jesus repeatedly told his disciples that he was going to rise from the dead. And the scriptures repeatedly in the Old Testament promised that Christ will rise from the dead. Peter, when he preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, he says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. There's his suffering. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God, the Father, raised him up by the power of the Spirit. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because, hear this, it was not possible for him to be held by it. I wonder if you noticed two of the hymns already we've sung have that beautiful line, they don't say Jesus might not be held by death. Death wouldn't hold him. But rather, two of the hymns said death could not hold him. It was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he goes on to say, his confidence in this, he says, for David says concerning him, and then he quotes Psalm 16. He's saying, look, the scriptures testify to the fact that Christ couldn't remain in the grave. He would be raised from the dead. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 22. And it speaks about the sufferings of Christ and then the glories of Christ. 
It looks ahead to both the cross and the resurrection. Time again, the Old Testament, we read these promises that Christ would be raised from the dead. It's a glorious, wonderful truth. Christ's resurrection, we read in Romans 1, demonstrates that the Lord Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. It is through his resurrection that we can be sure that his atoning work was accomplished. Acts 17 tells us that the resurrection of Christ points forward to the fact that he's coming to judge all people. We're told that we are justified through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have a living hope, a sure and certain hope. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. The farmers who had, had planted crops and hoping that they're someday going to uh, ripen and be ready to eat, the first of them they would offer to God. Partly as a testimony of the fact that they were trusting the rest of their crops would ripen. The first fruits. The Lord Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is alive. He has been exalted. He is coming again. We can be sure of this. We need to trust the scriptures. All the wonderful, glorious promises that tell us he's coming again. The very things that we've sung about this morning. Our confidence is not in the hymns, but it's in the scriptures. Christ had to rise from the dead because the scriptures tell us that he was going to rise from the dead. And all those promises that are given for us that we will one day be raised from the dead. We can be sure of them because of his resurrection. The scriptures encourage us. The scriptures comfort us. They make sense of our suffering. They give us this living hope, this joyful hope. We're waiting for the trumpet blast. Do you ever maybe hear the siren from the local prison and think, is that it? You should do. When you hear that siren, you should be thinking, this could be it. Oh, glorious day. This could be it. I'm going to see my saviour. It's certain. It's sure. John Owen, a faithful British pastor in the 17th century, he was on his deathbed. In fact, he was just a few hours away from his death. In his last hours, when on his dying bed, he dictated a short letter to a friend. I hope you die well. I want to die well. He's a few hours away from death and he's still thinking, how can I encourage others? He dictated a short letter to a friend. The secretary had written, I'm yet in the land of the living, meaning that he hadn't died yet. I'm yet in the land of the living. When Owen at once arrested him, stop! You must change that. He said, right, I'm yet in the land of the dying but I hope soon to be in the land of the living. At our deaths, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ gives us hope like nothing else will. He was raised. We too will be raised. He will surely do all that he has promised. Thirdly, trust the scriptures. Christ has to be proclaimed. Christ has to be proclaimed. Look with me at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, and he's going to tell them of three things that have to happen by God's decree and because they are in the scriptures. And it's clearer in the original languages than than it is here in the English. But there are three things, he says, that have to happen regarding Christ. 
that Christ had to suffer, that Christ had to be raised, and that Christ had to be proclaimed. There are three verbs, all in the same tense. These things must be fulfilled. And he said to them, thus it is written, verse 46, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, verse 47, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. The scriptures tell us Bear with me. The scriptures tell us of God's wonderful, glorious plan of redemption. It's not plan B. This was God's plan before the foundation of the world. That when mankind becomes ruined by sin, we all inherit the sin nature of Adam, the first sinner. God's plan was for his glory through the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, that a people would be saved for himself. In fact, Scripture says that the Father gave these people to the Son. Christ died for these people. And these elect, these chosen by the Father, will be saved. Christ has finished his work of atonement. How will they be saved? And they will surely be saved. Jesus said, everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. How will they be saved? Through hearing the gospel. Through hearing the gospel. Through hearing the proclamation of the message of Christ. Scripture tells us faith comes through hearing the message of Christ. So, just as it is God's intention that, that Christ should suffer and be raised from the dead, so it is his purpose that the gospel of Christ should be proclaimed to all nations. This is a fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham that through the seed, through the Lord Jesus, all nations would be blessed. The gospel has to go out to all nations for the fulfillment of what God has promised. So not only did Christ have to suffer, not only did Christ have to be raised from the dead, we serve a risen Saviour, but Christ had to be proclaimed. He has to be proclaimed. Remember how Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This gives us great hope. Missionaries, it's, it's a great hope that it's the, the gospel that has the power as, as the Holy Spirit breathes life into dead sinners. He uses the scriptures to bring life. 1 Peter tells us that we are born again through the living and abiding word of God. He gives us hope as we share the gospel, as we evangelize our friends and family and neighbors. We realize it's not down to me using persuasive words. People often say to me, they say, I could never share the gospel with my friends because they're going to ask me about que a question about something and I'm not going to know the answer. Friend, you don't need to know the answer. You need to know the scriptures. Memorize the scriptures. Share the scriptures. Because the power of God lies in the gospel. It's through the faithful passing on of the scriptures that people are saved. And so, Christ must be proclaimed so that people might repent and find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a plan B or plan C. This is the plan. This is God's plan. And if you are in Christ, you can either be disobedient. Remember the Great Commission. We're commanded to go and make disciples of all nations. Those who are dead in their sin 
that have been chosen by God are going to come to life through hearing the gospel, you can either be disobedient and not be a part of this, or you can be obedient. In a faltering, hesitant, maybe fearful, imperfect way, but you can be a part of this through sharing the scriptures. And if you are feel fearful, if you are nervous about doing this, attend the Grace Evangelism course, which will help to equip you to share the scriptures, to share the gospel with people. And look with me also. The Lord is so kind, so gracious, knowing our weakness. We've been given a helper. Verse 48, the Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples. He says, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm, a, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with, what? Power from on high. The Lord Jesus sends his Spirit so that believers might be empowered. We seek to glorify God. That's our chief end, isn't it? What is our mission? It's to proclaim Christ. This is going to happen one way or another. Don't you want to share in the joy of seeing people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, being saved through, in part, your efforts? It's to the end that we are faithful in sharing the scriptures that people are saved. Listen to what John Wesley said. Here we see it's an illustration that the power lies in the Spirit using the Scriptures. John Wesley was once stopped by a robber and demanded his money or his life. It's a bit corny, isn't it? Your money or your life. Mr. Wesley, after giving him the money, said, let me speak one word to you. The time may come when you will regret the course of your life in which you are now engaged. And then... Quoting 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7, he said, Remember this, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all our sin. No more was said and they parted. Many years after Wesley was going out of a church building in which he'd been preaching, a stranger introduced himself and asked him if he remembered being waylaid at such a time. He said he recalled it. The stranger said, I was that man. And that single verse you quoted on that occasion was the means of a total change in my life and habits. I've heard the same before. I met a man on the south coast of South Africa who had been saved by seeing a verse of scripture on the wall of a church building and meditating on it. And he was cut to the quick. He was convicted of his sin. And he lay hold of Christ through a verse of scripture. The man said, I've long since been in the practice of attending the house of God and of giving attention to his word and trust that I am a Christian. One small verse of scripture was the seed. This proclamation will happen. Christ must suffer. The scriptures make sense of our suffering. We need to trust the scriptures. Christ had to rise from the dead. Again, it's the scriptures that made it plain that this would happen. And it's the scriptures that give us this living hope that one day we will be raised. We will be with Christ forever. And the proclamation of Christ must take place. Christ must be heralded. It's the most important task that we have. Let me end with a quote from William Qua uh, Carey. William Carey was a missionary. He went out to India to preach the gospel there. By God's grace, he successfully translated the scriptures into a number of different languages. But while he was still in England, 
He was working as a cobbler, a shoemaker, and he was doing his best to share the gospel with as many people as he could. He wasn't on the mission field yet, but he had the joy of sharing the gospel with people. A friend one day came up to him and said, I want to speak to you, William Carey, very seriously. Well, said Carey, what is it? His friend said, by your going about to people as you do, you're neglecting your business. If only you attended to making shoes more than you do, you would be all right and you would soon get on and prosper. But as it is, you're simply neglect neglecting your business. Carey replied, neglecting my business? My business is to extend the kingdom of God and I only cobble shoes to pay expenses. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you that we have the scriptures in our own language. Thank you for the testimony of the scriptures concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thank you that there is life in Christ. Thank you that he has borne our sins in his body on the tree. He was buried and on the third day, according to the scriptures, he was raised to new life and he is coming again. Thank you for the sure and certain hope that we have. Oh, Father, would you please work in us, please, such that we would all the more trust what you have said and so give our lives joyfully to making Christ known until he comes again. Knowing that this is your plan. This is your purpose. This pleases you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.